Hello, and welcome to this webinar on demystifying Kobe. My name is David Spihar. I'm a client solutions manager with Dorofis, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started here. So in this webinar, I'm going to break down some of the basic concepts of Kobe, and I'm going to address the roles that everyone from the building owner to the construction trades play in this process, and hopefully dispel some myths along the way around the tools and the workflows that are used for capturing and delivering Kobe. Finally, at the end, I'm going to show you how Dorofis is being used by many teams to help leverage their project data to efficiently meet these Kobe deliverable requirements. So just a little bit about me. I'm actually a recovering architect with a good amount of uh, industry experience both in practicing architecture and implementing design technologies, mostly in large design firms. And early in my career, I spent a lot of time working directly with facility operations teams for large hospital and university projects and was always fascinated with really the amount of effort it took them to maintain these buildings. So naturally, when I got into the whole BIM thing, I had a real interest in using software and the emerging technologies and, and all this information that's now available to us to really improve the facility operations and asset management. So that's why this whole Kobe thing has become very interesting to me and I, I hope that I can help everyone understand it a little better through this webinar. So why Kobe anyway? It seems that many people have a love-hate relationship with it. And if you read some blogs out there, it's just flat out hate. And I think a lot of this really comes from a fundamental lack of understanding of Kobe and the purpose it serves, which is why I hope to help demystify it today. At its core, Kobe is really nothing more than a data structure used to standardize information for consumption by facility and asset management platforms. I mean, that's basically it. Uh, so why is it so misunderstood and scary to people? Uh, before we dive into that, let's take a very brief look at how Kobe began. And it all started with NASA and the Army Corps of in Engineers, and they had enough of the traditional handover process that I think everybody has gotten tired of and said, you know, this sucks. Uh, maybe not those exact words, but you get the point. Uh, so we've seen countless photos of the poor dude sitting in his desk with boxes and boxes of O&Ms and reams of drawings sitting in front of him. And we all know that that is uh, a, a flawed delivery at, at project closeout. Uh, so NASA and the Army Corps, they partnered with NIBS and the Kobe project was born. And according to Bill East at Prairie Sky Consulting, who is a very good resource if you don't know who Bill is, uh, the Kobe project basically started by asking two questions around how data could be used to replace this traditional mess. Uh, so the first question was, what do we need to know about our buildings? You know, things such as defining what assets we need to maintain, what information do we need to know about those assets, and how do we find them? And then the second question was, in what format should the information be delivered? If we're going to get rid of traditional paper and drawings and all of that, what type of digital format can be delivered? And they decided to use XM for the language format for several reasons, uh, mostly because it's an open standard that emphasizes simplicity, and oh, by the way, it's human readable in Excel, and since many people are used to looking at spreadsheets in Excel, it seemed to be a logical source. And without diving too deeply into a history lesson, here are a few highlights in the development and testing of Kobe. Uh, you can see that there was quite a bit of activity over about a 10-year period, and the last updated release was in 2014, which is Kobe version 2.4. Now, as far as how Dorofis fits into this, uh, we passed the Building Programming Information Exchange test back in 2013, which is basically a really long way of saying, we've proven that our software can meet the Kobe data structure in delivering data. Uh, and last year released some pretty major improvements in our ability to help teams manage Kobe data within a project in Dorofis. Now as part of this Kobe project, some studies were also done to estimate the value of building to building owners. I mean, if you're going to make such a huge process change, you need to see what the ROI will be. So in this study, for instance, they estimated a staggering savings of 96% or over a half million dollars in the cost of the handover and the ability to operate the buildings. Now is 96% savings realistic on every project? Maybe not, uh, but the bottom line is that if this is done the right way and for the right reasons, the savings realized in the data handover for operations, it will most definitely exceed the investment in software and people required to deliver it. Now the key to this is understanding how a team can efficiently meet these requirements so we can realize the savings on the back end and not spend a lot of extra time actually being able to get to that point. 
So after all this research, testing, and validation showing that a data standard is good and COBE is good, uh, why is it still so misunderstood? Now, I believe it's because COBE is viewed as a data collection exercise after the fact. I mean, I've talked with many teams about implementing COBE deliverables, and most of the time they express the same concerns. They say, you know what, this is going to cost me a ton of money. And based on what I've heard, this perception usually stems from one of three reasons. Uh, first, it's because they just don't understand the true purpose of COBE, and all they've seen is a blank Excel file that looks incredibly daunting, so therefore it looks expensive. The second is because they don't know what information needs to be collected, and they're unsure if it's even their responsibility to collect it. So if I'm going to estimate the effort, am I going to put a big number to this or a small number to this? And it's very difficult to estimate it because there's so many variables. And then the third thing is that they assume the only workflow is to try to extract all the data out of their BIM after the models are built. Now they only find out at this point that the models don't contain everything needed for COBE or the information is not 100% accurate. Now I know we all strive for good models, but there are some realistic constraints and some limitations around modeling to be able to efficiently get all the COBE data out of the models. Now this results in large amounts of time spent modeling content or fixing models just so we can extract data at the end that truly adds no value to the individual's workflows, whether it's the design team or the construction team. So ultimately, Kobe scares teams because it's viewed as a reactive data gathering exercise, not proactive information management. And through the course of this webinar, I'll show you how Dorofis supports Kobe's natural progression of developing and capturing a project's requirements in a single database, and how delivering Kobe can actually be an efficient, proactive byproduct of the design and construction process, not added effort to collect data after the fact. Now that we've had a little history lesson and a better understanding of the intent, let's dive into how it works. As I mentioned, because the format settled on was XML, the most common readable way that this gets displayed is through the Kobe Excel spreadsheet. Now, while the Excel spreadsheet is in no way the best way to collect the data, it is the best way for us to understand the data structure. So for the purposes of this webinar, I'm going to dive into this Excel file a little bit. I'm guessing most of you have probably seen the Kobe spreadsheet. If not, you could download a copy from the NIBS website, which is posted here at the bottom of the slide. Basically, the spreadsheet is comprised of multiple worksheets that represent different data tables that are interconnected. Now, each worksheet contains multiple columns that are color-coded to collect the data as follows. So the yellow columns are required. These include each table's primary key and core element attributes. The salmon fields are also required, and these are essentially foreign keys. Now for you non-data nerds, a foreign key is a connection across worksheets in Excel, or basically it's a connection across the data tables. The purple columns, those are references back to the authoring software platforms. Uh, and then finally, the green columns, these are anything else that an owner may need for their specific project. We're going to talk a lot about these later because these represent a good chunk of the information in the Kobe data structure. Again, each worksheet represents a table in this data structure. And one myth I'd like to dispel right away is that the information must be populated in all the worksheets. It doesn't. Now, while the worksheets are connected, they are not all required. And it's really based on what the building owner wants, which we'll definitely talk about later. So don't think that just because a worksheet exists, it must include data. So when we look at all of the worksheets, we can really break them down into the first eight. And these are the ones that are most important to owners, at least that I've worked with, in capturing information about their building. And these are the ones we're going to focus on today. Along with these, those, we're going to also focus on the documents worksheet. Now, this one is important. We'll talk about it. But note that most teams find this one a little bit tricky to navigate because there are so many external document management platforms out there. Uh, but nonetheless, this information is certainly important. And then finally, these last few worksheets, while I don't want to minimize the importance of them, they don't tend to be as important to most owners that I've worked with. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to really talk about them today. But again, all these worksheets are intended to be connected if they're needed. And if they're not needed, that connection isn't necessary, neither is the data inside of them. Now, how do all these worksheets come together to present a complete data picture of a building? I love infographics. 
I love to take incredibly complicated topics and dumb them down into simple diagrams. Uh, I hope you love infographics too because I'm going to use them to basically take a super simple look at the most commonly used worksheets that we just talked about to create this picture. First is the facility worksheet, which is incredibly straightforward. It's usually just one row for a typical project, and it's documenting the basics about the building. Its size, its use type, site address, things like that. Each building on a larger campus project, if you had multiple buildings, would just have its own row. But it's a pretty straightforward uh, worksheet. The next three worksheets, which are the floor, space, and zone, they break down as follows. First of all, the floor worksheet, that is intended to represent each level of the building as defined in the drawings. Now this is every habitable level of the building, but it also includes all the roofs and a level for the site. The next one is the space worksheet, and spaces are most commonly recorded as all the rooms in the building, uh, but also are intended to capture spatial regions outside of the building, such as the site and roofs. So if you've got a service equipment yard or rooftop equipment, those are captured as part of those spaces in the worksheet. And then finally is the zones worksheet. And this is a way of grouping spaces or the rooms for a common purpose. Now this can be as simple as departments, but can be other groupings as well. So things such as security zones, life safety, etc. So when we talk about owners' responsibilities, this is a really good example of where they need to define the zone requirements so you know how they need those spaces categorized. The next is the type worksheet. And the type worksheet is intended to capture each unique asset type that is identified in the drawings and required for the deliverable. It's most likely not going to be every asset in the building, which is another thing that trips teams up, but it is intended to capture each unique asset type that is required for the deliverable. And then the component worksheet further captures data about every instance or every occurrence where a specific asset type is installed in the building, such as in rooms or on the roof of the site. Next, when we look at the system worksheet, this then creates a relationship between all the components or, or the assets and their associated systems. So the idea is that an asset can be located either within a space it serves or as part of an overall system for maintenance. So here are all the VAV boxes in a supply air system that require maintenance at defined intervals. Or here is all the equipment in a specific room, and these are the systems that serve each piece of equipment. So it's intended to create this complete picture of all the different components of a building. Now it's important to note that in the systems worksheet, not all components need to have systems defined and not all components will even have systems to begin with. So like doors, for instance, wouldn't have a system in other cases where systems may not need to be defined if the system isn't required by the owner. And finally then, the document worksheet in is intended to identify and organize all of the documentation collected throughout the life of the project and connect them to their specific assets. So it categorizes all project documentation from shop drawings and product data to test reports, certificates, and the infamous O&Ms with the connection to the asset types. The idea is that all the documentation that is traditionally delivered in boxes or rolls of drawings with no real good connection to anything in the building other than, hey, here's the building and here's the documentation for it, this is intended to connect, connect it all. So in the end, the information found in the various Kobe worksheets creates a connected picture of what the building owner needs to know about their building and all of its assets, all in a data structure that's ready to feed into their facility management systems. Now, if you compare this approach to the traditional method that we've talked about, you can see why the Kobe project estimated huge cost savings for building owners. Now, the question is, how can we do this in a way where we can be efficient and still realize that value? Now, as I mentioned earlier, Kobe is intended to be a collaborative effort that evolves with the project. Because of this, everyone from the building owner to the trade contractors are going to play a critical role in making the process efficient and successful. After understanding the data structure and how the worksheets come together, it's really most important now to talk about the team's roles and responsibilities. And frankly, if the entire team does not buy in and understand their roles, it will become exactly what scares teams today. It's going to become a time-consuming data collection exercise instead of a proactive information management collaborative effort. So how do we avoid this? 
Now, I'm sure many of you have seen this diagram. I think it's very useful to provide a general outline of responsibilities for data capture. However, what most teams are missing are tools that help them understand the information that is actually required. So data doesn't really become information until it's structured and has a purpose. And Kobe solves the structured part, but it doesn't solve the purpose. And only the building owner can define that purpose because it's their building. I certainly don't mean to pick on building owners, but the reality is that they hold the keys to a team's efficiency and accuracy in collecting and capturing Kobe data. I mean, after all, the cost will ultimately be paid by the building owner regardless, so it's in their best interest to clearly define their requirements. Remember that 96% savings. So let's take a look at the various stakeholders and the roles they play, and we're going to start with the building owner. And if you're a building owner contemplating the transition to Kobe, there are a few steps you can take to provide clarity to the design and construction teams. And I think if you take these steps, you can greatly increase the efficiency of the process and help remove the fear of Kobe. Now, the first thing you can do is refine the amount of information you need. And I've had owners take the Excel file and say, here, give me Kobe. And that's why we are where we are today, which is what scares teams. What you really need to do is say, I want a Kobe deliverable. This is the information I need, and this is what I need and why I need that information. Now, since the Excel file provides a clear picture of that entire data structure, it can be a handy tool to identify only those attributes needed for a deliverable. So as a building owner, be realistic about the purpose and what you need to know. Because while Kobe offers a lot of options for capturing data, sometimes less is more. So define the data that will be used downstream first, and then isolate the worksheets required to provide that data. And while the worksheets are connected, as I mentioned earlier, they may not all be required based on the purpose. So if you don't need them, don't include them. Just tell the team, I don't need these worksheets. Next, be practical about what you need to know about the building and the assets inside all of the worksheets. So there are roughly 50 columns across the worksheets that are green or, or as required if specified. And as the building owner, you're the only one that knows if they are needed. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, is knowing the shape, color, finish, constituents, or features of an asset type important? If it's not important, don't specify them. And this is one of the ways where you can greatly reduce the stress and improve the accuracy if you spend a little time thinking about what information you really need and isolating just that information. This on its own can greatly reduce the cost of capturing the data because you've really now refined which worksheets you need and which columns of information inside each worksheet are necessary. Now, what is an asset? This one is almost too obvious to mention, but it needs to be said since it has huge impact on the effort required to collect data. With thousands or tens of thousands of products installed in a building, this can get out of control quickly. Now, as a building owner, all products installed in your building may not be considered assets or be considered assets that are going to be maintained inside one of your, your CAFM systems. So be precise about what you need to manage and identify a finite list of assets that are required. Uh, I have some owners that I've worked with who provide a master asset list in Excel, and they'll give it to the, the team and say, listen, here are all the assets that we need to maintain in our platforms, and it's up to the team to then go through the list and identify which assets are actually in the building they're designing. Now, it gives the teams a starting point, and if it's not in that list, a team doesn't need to collect it. So you can really narrow down the effort to a pretty manageable list of assets. In most buildings, it is interesting when you really get to the bottom of it that the number of assets that really need to be tracked for a defined purpose isn't that scary. If you look at the whole list, you think, oh my God, but when you really pare it down based on what's in the building, it's not that bad. So remember, there's no value in collecting data and assets that aren't integrated with IWMS systems. So be realistic and avoid throwing them in just in case. And the other thing we need to talk about is defining data sources. What I mean by that is that in many cases, there are suggestions for information to put into fields. Uh, good examples are the category or description columns in the worksheets. Now remember, just because the data fields, which I'll call containers, are known, so if you know that you want that field, that doesn't mean the information source or the content is clear of what goes into that field. So for instance, in several worksheets, the category column rec rec recommends omniclass tables as a default. 
Now, if you're using the Omni class tables, uh, first of all, say that you're using them. Um, but how deep into the tables is required for your purpose? Uh, take mechanical fans, for instance. Do you need them to be classified as just fans? or centrifugal fans, or double inlet centrifugal fans. So those are three different levels deep in that Omniclass table. And if you're not using the Omniclass table, then what will be used? I have worked with owners in the past that they don't use the Omniclass table. They have their own custom classification systems or uniformat. Um, but you need to provide that to your design and construction teams. Every worksheet also has a description column. And what should the description be? So if you look at the definition, the description is supposed to be a general text description or a value to match the drawings if present. Now, this could be something that's in the drawings, or this could be something that ties a specific naming or coding system of yours to the values on the drawings, right? So if you have a drawing that calls out air handlers as AHU123, if you've got a different coding system for those air handlers, this is an opportunity to map those. Or better yet, provide the design team with your specific codes up front to input into the drawings to start so that relationship is already created, created so there's a value in the drawings to match the description. Now many times teams, and I've seen this, spend a great deal of effort retroactively applying these asset codes to content that could have been done much faster if it was known up front. As an owner, standards such as naming conventions and equipment codes are all up to you. you know, don't rel rely on the design team to provide them for you. Uh, this is usually what happens when extracting Kobe data out of models. You get what the design team puts in, not what you know you need. Now remember, this is your data as the owner, so you need to define how it is structured for your use. Now I'll show you in Dorofus how we can predefine your standards and map pretty much any data source to a container for the Kobe export. And finally, make sure everything is clearly documented so teams can plan accordingly. Here's a great example from Alberta Infrastructure's Digital Project Delivery COBE requirements that does just this. Now, if you're not familiar with Alberta Infrastructure, they're responsible for planning, building, and managing much of the government-owned infrastructure in the province. And I think they're a really good resource if you want to see how an owner started with defining their asset information requirements first and then building the COBE data structure around them. Now, we're currently helping several teams use Dorofus to meet Alberta Infrastructure Kobe deliverables and I can tell you firsthand how incredibly valuable it is for a team to know what the owner wants from the beginning. It really does help the team become more efficient in planning for that deliverable and for the information gathering throughout the life of the project. Let's pick on the design team for a little bit here. Now, when we talk about the responsibilities of the design team, the focus is understandably going to be around BIM. And for those of you living in the BIM management world, which I lived in for many years, this importance of well-built models is nothing new. Now, for years, I educated teams on the idea that not every project needs to be a Swiss watch, but rather all modeled content should have a purpose and be consistent and accurate. And if that's done, then it can be a good source to connect the Kobe data. Now, before the days of data deliverables like Kobe, any of this lack of consistency or accuracy was an annoyance. But now we're seeing it can be a source of a huge amounts of lost revenue. And lost revenue in fixing poorly built or incomplete models just to create this accurate data picture. So since many Kobe fields reference what's on the drawings as a design team, the models are a logical source for some of that data. So simple things like consistent naming of levels across all models can now have an impact. So remember the floor worksheet, for instance, is intended to record all of the floors of the building on the drawings. So what happens on a large project where you've got multiple models and the data isn't accurate across all those models? So as a designer, when you're looking at Kobe responsibility and you're looking at things like BIM execution plans and LODs, you know, there are certain areas where model fidelity is going to be really important to create data fidelity. So consistent naming of levels, pretty simple thing to do, and it's going to help you out in the long run. And since many of the other Kobe fields reference the physical location of rooms and assets, it stands to reason that the model should be a source for that data as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm such and such a room, I'm so big, I live on this floor of the building, and these are the assets that live inside of me. Now, what better place is there for that data to live than in the models? Now, while the models need to be a source for a portion of the data like we just talked about, not all of it needs to live in them. And I think too many teams put too much emphasis on the amount of data to populate in their models. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons when I talk with teams that Kobe is viewed as an added cost is the assumption that the only workflow is to try and extract all the data out of BIM after the models are built. 
Now, because of this, I've seen teams struggle a great deal with efficiently delivering Kobe in BIM, although BIM can be a great tool to help, but they struggle with efficiently delivering all of it in BIM for several reasons. Now, first of all, while tools like Revit or ARCHICAD are great for modeling and documentation, they aren't very secure databases. Now, without change logs and user permissions, we've all seen it for those of you working inside of these tools, data can get manipulated and modified very easily without knowing why or in the end if it's correct. So if you're extracting all the data out of a model, how do you know it's correct? And I had an owner tell me once that he would rather have models with no data in them because he, said, he told me that bad data is way worse than no data, which I thought is a really interesting point. So that's one of the things <clears throat> that um, teams are having trouble with an efficient delivery, getting things out of, out, out of BIM. Uh, another reason is that there are typically a lot of models on a single project. So on really big projects, you can have, you know, tens or thirties or hundreds of models on projects. Um, with all of these models, which is going to be the source of truth for the data? So, you know, something simple like toilets. Are the toilets in the plumbing engineer's model the correct ones? Or are they the toilets in the architecture model? Or maybe the plumbing traits model is the one that's going to be the host for that data. Um, which one is it? Which is the source of truth? When you're dealing with federated models for a single export, sometimes identifying that correct source of truth can be a real challenge. And it can result in a lot of wasted effort and duplicate effort too. And then sometimes manipulating large amounts of information like Kobe is easier in a tabular format. So although Excel is not the best way to capture the information, when you talk about looking at large amounts of data, tabular formats sometimes can be easier to, to consume it and manipulate it. Then it can be um, managed inside of a graphical modeling software. So again, while, while BIM tools are great for knowing all the geometry and the geometric relationships. Sometimes different tools are better for viewing large amounts of data. Now I'll show you later how the Kobe data can be controlled by Dorofa, speaking of different tools, in a single secure database. And it can have a bi-directional connection to the content in the various federated models. Now the final Kobe deliverable rests in the construction team's hands and typically the trade contractors are going to be responsible for adding asset information and in most cases the construction manager is ultimately going to be responsible for collecting, organizing, and validating everything. So when you really break down a Kobe design deliverable versus a Kobe construction deliverable, you can see that most of the effort is really going to fall on the contractors. So now while there's no denying that there's an effort involved in preparing a data deliverable like Kobe, it will require far less effort if it's not treated as this data collection exercise that I keep talking about, but instead if it's treated as a collaborative effort where the building owner defines their requirements, and the design team have done their part to collaborate on defining the building's contents in their models and their documents. And if all of this has been done, then when the contractors come on board, they will be able to most efficiently layer their information on top of what's already been established. Now, what makes the contractors part so difficult and frankly expensive is the lack of defined data standards and lack of model fidelity. Now, we're doing a massive data collection exercise at the end without fully understanding the requirements up front. Now, I'm sure projects exist where this isn't an issue, but what I hear from the teams I'm working with is that this is a common challenge that most of them are facing. So when we look at the contractor's side, uh, while they do tend to have the largest portion of the work, if they are involved from the beginning or as early as possible, and if the stage has been set by the owner and the design team, their work should be much more efficient because they're layering information on top of what already exists. Hopefully by this point I've helped clear up some of the misconceptions that make Kobe seem a little scary and expensive. And hopefully I've given you some tools to be more efficient on your next project. Now speaking of uh, giving you tools to be more efficient, I really want to spend the rest of the time demonstrating how Dorofus can be used to facilitate the management and delivery of the building's information, ultimately in the Kobe format. So for those of you that are not familiar with Dorofus at all, this is just a real quick overview to orient you to how the software works. Now Dorofus is a planning and data management software and it's used to define and manage a project's design and functional requirements. So we're also a BIM collaboration tool, we have Revit and ARCHICAD plugins and an IFC integration that allows teams to validate the design requirements against the model development. And Dorofus supports the evolution of a project's information by allowing teams to share their knowledge in a collaborative platform, which 
coincidentally, is at the core of Kobe. So the process is fairly straightforward. You know, project requirements get planned into Rofus so teams can see exactly what needs to go into the building, from the rooms to where assets are used to the systems that they're part of. Then the modeled content gets validated against these requirements. So now Kobe data isn't extracted out of models after the fact, rather it is connected to and validated against defined requirements that are set up front. This vastly improves the speed and quality of the deliverables for a project team. And then each member adds the information directly into the shared location as it's known. So now contractors can come in and they can layer their as installed information directly onto the existing data inside of Dorofus without duplicating effort. And then ultimately this data is maintained in a single database, not federated models. Now it's connected to the models, but only where we need to know information about the geometry in the models. And this is all in a structure ready for the Kobe Excel export without any additional effort to actually create the export. Again, it is a natural progression and a byproduct of the design and construction process. Now, Dorofus is used for much, much more than just collecting Kobe data, but we're going to just focus on the Kobe stuff for now, given the fact that this is a Kobe webinar. Dorofus is built, as I mentioned, on a bunch of different modules, and they're intended to capture the building's design requirements and be expanded upon as a project progresses. So in each module you can see here on my screen, I've mapped the various Kobe worksheets or data tables to how they relate to those modules. And coincidentally, or conveniently, Dorofus's modules are set up to essentially, by default, follow the Kobe data structure. And once the Dorofus database is configured to capture the required Kobe data, the team can then decide what level the content in a model, such as Revit or ARCHICAD, will be used to populate the data. So they can also decide which models and how much data is connected since a single Dorofus database can be connected to multiple federated models. Now in Revit, for instance, the team decides which Dorofus attributes are connected to Revit parameters and where data is pushed to Revit from Dorofus, pushed to Dorofus from Revit, or just manage in Dorofus without any connection. The goal is to leverage, again, as much modeled content as practical to maintain that connection to the geometry, but without wholly relying on the model and to consolidate the Kobe data in a single database. Now, I know this sounds super awesome. I'm going to go ahead and jump out of PowerPoint now, and we're going to do a brief demonstration of how this whole process works inside of Dorofus. The data set I have for this demonstration is a small, simple project since it's easy to see everything and understand the concepts of Dorofus and Kobe data management. Now remember from the infographic that Dorofus is built on many modules, and those modules have a pretty direct relationship to the Kobe worksheet. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to focus on the rooms, items, and systems modules. And as I go through each module, I'll do a quick overview of how Dorofus works while simultaneously diving into the Kobe stuff along the way. And I'm going to start in the rooms module, since rooms are at the core of Dorofus. Now here is where you capture everything you need to know about the building's program. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes working on large amounts of data is more easily done in a tabular format. You'll notice that the main workspace in Dorofus is like looking at a spreadsheet with a navigation pane on the left and a bunch of dialog boxes on the right to help. So the navigation pane is how rooms are organized inside of the functional structure. This is where teams plan their project by defining functions like departments and then creating rooms. Now rooms can be created natively inside of Dorofus or imported through Excel, or they can be pushed into Dorofus from Revit or ARCHICAD. But if I go ahead and I select the administration department, I can then start to isolate rooms like this conference room. And when I select the room, you'll now see the basic rooms properties on the right. Now the entire program is connected to the project's models, so any room you see here has a relationship to the rooms inside of Revit or ARCHICAD, and we're constantly monitoring that relationship. So dimensional data such as the conference room's design, ceiling height, and perimeter, all that information is coming out of the model, but the program area, for instance, is being driven by Dorofus. Now if I go ahead and select this room and open it, I could see all these properties a little bit better. You'll also see a bunch of tabs across the top. We're not going to go too deep into these, but there are examples of Dorofus being used to define the project's requirements from a design and planning standpoint. So room data, for instance, is a way where your team can capture all the design and functional requirements for a project. Now, owners can predefine these as their standard, or the design team can come in and capture these basically based on what the owner needs for a particular project. I'm not going to talk about images or documents, but the next few across the top, these are item lists. 
and these allow teams to plan and organize what goes into each room such as the furniture or mechanical services. Now when we talk about Kobe, the information you're seeing here gets mapped to data in the Excel file. So now let's look at starting to use Dorofus to capture data for rooms. And if I go back to the properties, you'll see a couple of Kobe export groupings here for space and zone. These are called composite text fields. Now these act as containers to map data from other attributes into single uneditable fields. These can be concatenated or just report a single attribute. These fields are what will ultimately get exported to the different Kobe worksheets. Now what's really nice about this is that the source data can come from any attribute in the room. So you can standardize the Kobe Excel export in a template and then modify where the information comes from based on each project's deliverable requirements. So for example, you can see here that the category for zone is blank. If I come off to the left, you'll see there's the actual field for the zone category. And if I go ahead and type occupancy zone and save and actually have to close and reopen the room. When I reopen it, you'll now see that the category in this composite text is populated because it's pulling that data from this uh, data field over here on the left. Now if I go ahead and I close the room, you'll see in the navigation pane there's also a tab for groups. These are other ways to organize rooms inside of the project. And in this case, the rooms are grouped by their levels in the model. So if I expand these, you'll see each level coming from the model. If I select the conference room, you'll now see that the space floor name is being populated by this data coming from these groupings. Remember earlier when I talked about model fidelity? This is an example of how that translates directly to an efficient and accurate Kobe export. So another use for groups would be if the building owner, for instance, required a different way to categorize rooms in the zone worksheet. Right now, I'm pulling the department as the zone. So if I look over here, Kobe export zone, my zone name is my department. I'm pulling that, but it could be mapped to something else like a security or life safety zone. Again, those would just be other groupings that would be ways to organize the rooms, and then we would push that field into this composite text instead. So now at this point, just about all the data needed to export to Kobe for floors, spaces, and zones has already been captured without duplicating effort to create the export. So for the design team, a good amount of the Kobe design deliverable is merely a byproduct of your normal design workflow. Now we're starting to see the efficiency of treating Kobe as proactive information management, not reactive data gathering. All right, next let's talk a little bit about items. I'm going to open up the items module now. So in Dorofus, an item is anything you need to track in a building, from furniture to finishes to equipment and fixtures. And in the context of Kobe, an item relates directly to a Kobe asset type. So for you building owners, think of this as a master asset register, where you can predefine every asset type that is important to you. This includes standards such as naming conventions, asset codes, and any other information you'll want exported to the Kobe type worksheet. So if you think back to the roles and responsibilities for Kobe, this is an example of where you can predefine what you need, making the team much more efficient. Now, just like the rooms module, there's a navigation pane to organize all of your items inside of item groups. Now, I have it structured here by assembly codes, but items can be grouped however you'd like. And like rooms, items can be created natively inside of Dorofus, or they can be imported through Excel or connected to Revit and ArchiCAD and pushed in that way. So let's look at a couple examples. So first, I'm going to look at some furniture. So if I go to the furnishings, the movable furnishings category here, and if I select this conference table, you can see the table's properties on the right. Now take note of the to be modeled checkbox. This is how we connect to content in Revit or ArchiCAD. You'll see the benefits of this relationship when we look at managing Kobe data with modeled content later. If I go ahead and open up the documents and images dialogs here on the right, you can now start to see a little bit more information that's connected to this table. All right, another good example would be a piece of mechanical equipment such as a VAV box. So if I go to my services and let's go to my air distribution, and let me select this VAV box, and I'm going to go ahead and open it. And you can see all the properties a little bit better. Uh, now you'll note that like rooms, we have the Kobe export grouping for, of data for type on the right. 
Again, this is composite text mapped to other attributes teed up for the Excel export. You'll also see some tabs across the top, which are the item specifications. Now, we're not going to get into these, um, but like rooms, this is an example of Dorofus being used to define the project's requirements from a design and planning standpoint. So if you're a building owner, you can predefine the specification requirements based on your asset standards, or the design team can use it to gather the building owner's requirements. But when we talk about Kobe, for items, it's a little different than rooms since more information is needed. And for items, you'll see that we have a section dedicated to Kobe type data. And if I open that, in this tab is where the Kobe information gets populated for each asset type. Now first you'll see there's a maintainable asset checkbox. Checking this allows an owner or a team to confirm Firm that only the assets that are required for a deliverable are going to be maintained. So thinking back to the building owner's responsibilities, defining exactly which items are assets can greatly reduce the amount of effort. Another connection to the owner's responsibilities is to define which fields of data are required. So remember all the green columns in Excel? Each of these fields represents a column in the type worksheet. So what you're seeing here is a lot of potential data input. And as we've discussed, not all of these fields may be needed for a specific project. So we can filter them. So if I go ahead and close this, I can select this item group and I can change its view filter to my Kobe deliverable and save that. If I reopen the VAV box, you'll see that I've now isolated just the Kobe type data and inside it, I've isolated just the fields that are required for the deliverable. These are the fields that are mapped to the composite text. So this can be applied to every item and user permissions can be set to allow access only to the people responsible for inputting the Kobe data. Now, if you think about the idea of collaborative information management for Kobe, imagine identifying all the maintainable asset types with the checkbox and then isolating the fields required for the type export that I just showed you. I can go ahead now and I can filter all of my assets by that checkbox. Once I have all of those filtered, I can open up my Kobe type data, my specifications. I can close a couple other dialogues here. And if I come down to my air distribution and I now have isolated just the maintainable assets from that list, I can multi-select them, and now I can start editing their Kobe data. So I can change this asset type to fixed. When I save that, and now if I select that same VAV box, you can see over here in the right for my Kobe export type that that asset type has now been populated as fixed. So this is a nice way now to start to really isolate and minimize the amount of effort required for capturing these Kobe requirements. Now that we've successfully isolated the types required, let's move on to the components worksheet. Now, if you recall earlier, a Dorofus occurrence relates directly to a Kobe component. Now I'm gonna open up the occurrence dialog and with this open, you can now see everywhere where this specific VAV box is placed inside of the building. So again, an item in Dorofus directly relates to a Kobe asset type, and every occurrence is a component. Note that with this conference room selected, the properties window has changed on the right, and now it's showing me the properties for the occurrence instead of the item. Here is where we've mapped more composite texts in the Kobe export groupings for the component and system worksheets. You'll also see some fields are here for actually inputting component data such as serial number, barcode, and installation dates. Now when we're dealing with capturing information such as serial numbers or barcodes for thousands of assets, it isn't realistic to expect this to be populated directly inside of Dorofus. This is a great use of our Excel import tool where field information such as barcode scanner data can be appended to what's already existing. In the interest of time, I've already imported this data from my VAV units, but it could be done through this import export tool. Finally, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the systems module briefly before showing the Revit connection. In the systems module, 
is where items or asset types are planned in their systems and then occurrences or components are connected within the various systems. You'll see that we can organize systems by the OmniClass tables, and if I expand OmniClass table 21, I can isolate my HVAC air distribution system. It's going down there. Okay. Now if I select that, it'll show me my air handler. I can further expand the system connected to the air handler, and now it's going to show me all of my supply and return systems along with the equipment connected to it. Each line represents an occurrence. So if I select one of the VAV boxes, it shows me which room it serves. In this case, it's the office. And all of this is ultimately connected to the Kobe system worksheet. All right, so that's enough of a quick spin inside of Dorofis. I'm going to jump into Revit now so you can get a sense of how the Revit connection works. And for you ARCHICAD users out there, the workflow is essentially the same. Before the demo, I have two sessions of Revit open, one with the architect's model and one with the engineer's model, so you can see how we can connect a single Dorofis database across federated models. First thing we'll do is go into the architectural model. And if I open up the floor plan here, uh, you'll note that we have a plug-in with our own ribbon for both Revit and ARCHICAD. And I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to pick on that conference room that we were talking about earlier. Now if I select it and show its Revit properties, you'll see the basic room information you're used to seeing. You'll see next to it is our Dorofus properties pane. And if I select that, you're now looking at the Dorofus room inside of the Revit environment. And note the color-coded arrows show which attributes are connected to Revit parameters and the data flow between the two. You can see, for instance, that we're pushing the room name into Revit, which is a handy feature for standardization, but we're pulling the room number from the model. This little Kobe attribute configuration button is how you define these connections. If I scroll down, you now can see the Kobe export composite text fields from Dorofis inside of Revit. This is how we create a bi-directional relationship that leverages modeled content where practical and Dorofus attributes for consistency and consolidation into a single Kobe export. So for instance, if we look at the Kobe export space, and if we look at the room tag and description, you'll see the room tag is the room number and the description is the room name. If we scroll back up, you'll see that the name on drawing is what is populating the room description and the room number is populating the room tag and those both have a direct connection to the Revit model. This ensures that you have a bi-directional connection between the two but the data is hosted inside of Dorofus and additional attributes can be managed inside of the Dorofus database. So now when it comes to final deliverables, keep in mind that the attribute configuration in the lower left can be modified to push all the required Kobe composite text fields from Dorofus into Revit as new shared parameters. So what you're seeing here can actually be pushed into the Revit model. Uh, this isn't necessary since the entire Kobe Excel export is contained in Dorofus, but it could be useful at project closeout if an IFC is required. This workflow supports a connected IFC export by pushing the data into the models that is being managed inside of Dorofus. All right, next, let's take a look at how we validate the content in the models and connect it to the Kobe deliverable. So with this room selected, I'm going to go up to the Dorofus ribbon, and this time I'm going to do an items in room comparison. Now this is another example of how we're used by teams during design, but it also ensures content is where it's supposed to be for the Kobe deliverable. So if you remember the furniture item list we saw in Dorofus, this shows that the furniture matches the plan count in that list. Note that this also displays the planned items that are linked to families in the MEP model, which we'll look at in a minute. Now if I close this and I select the instance of that table, and if I scroll down, you'll see the composite text fields for the Kobe component worksheet are populated for this asset. Let's jump over into the mechanical model where we'll take a deeper look into this with the mechanical assets. Again, one of the really cool things about Dorofis is our ability to connect a single database to federated models. One example is our rooms. 
We can link a single Dorofus room across multiple models to manage consistent data in both rooms and spaces. So now inside of the mechanical model, if I zoom in and select this space, you'll see the Revit space properties. And just like the architectural model, you're also seeing the same Dorofus room properties. We're pushing and pulling less information here, but all of the Kobe export composite text fields are available and they're connected across both models. Next, I'll run an items and room comparison like I did in the architectural model. And this time, I'm now seeing the air terminals and VAV boxes, and they match the plan count. But I'm not seeing the tables and chairs because those are in the architectural model. Now, if I close this, and finally, if I select that VAV box, you'll see its Dorofus properties here, and you'll see the composite text fields for the component and system worksheet. This validates what's in the model is connected to a Dorofus item with all the Kobe export data safe and sound. This is where Dorofus acts as the single source of truth database connecting across all federated models. So you're not trying to manage all of this information in the modeled environment, you're managing it inside of Dorofus and you're deciding where this information gets connected to the geometry, again, in a strategic fashion. All right, so you're probably saying to yourself, so this is all pretty cool, but I want to see the Kobe export. All right, I'm going to jump back into Dorofus and wrap this up with the export. All right, so this is actually the easy part. So inside our reports module, you can create custom Excel reports that can be built from scratch or from formatted Excel files. And if I expand here and go to my Kobe export, in this case, I uploaded the Kobe 2.4 handover file as my template, and then I used it to map my composite text fields to the various comp corresponding columns in the various worksheets. This is another example of how we can isolate just the fields required for the export. Just like how all of the possible type fields exist, but we hid the unnecessary ones in our view filters in the items module, in this case we just map the composite text fields to the required columns in the Excel file so you know you're not getting unwanted data in the export. Now you could upload the different Kobe templates for design, construction, and handover, and you can run them at any time to check progress. I'm just going to select the export and run it, and let's take a look. It's going to run for a minute here, chugging through the data, and here we are. I'll just click through a few of the worksheets, but you can see that everything has populated and exported and is ready for handover. Pretty cool. All right, so I think that's enough of the spreadsheet. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for taking time today to attend this webinar. I hope I did a good job of demystifying Kobe and I've given you some useful suggestions on how to better plan for Kobe on your next project. I also hope I successfully demonstrated that Dorofus can be a great tool for improving not only your Kobe workflow, but the general process of managing a building's information throughout the life of a project. At this point, I'd like to use the remaining time we have to open it up for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and open the line and let's see what questions we have. Thanks again.